Hey, what's up Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, AKA Barnacles. Now you guys have been flooding me with messages telling me how much you love the Codegasm series. So here we are on episode three and I'm just gonna keep on going. In this episode, we're finally gonna build a real world application that has a lot of potential and you guys will be able to evolve this and do crazy stuff. We're gonna get into text to speech, using performance counters to pull real time information from your computer such as memory and CPU performance. We're gonna incorporate our random logic. And best of all, we're gonna take everything you've learned from the previous two episodes and incorporate them into this one. Now guys, I'm not gonna lie, this is a pretty long video, but stick with it, you're gonna see some really cool stuff and the end result will amaze you. All right, let's not waste any more time. It's time for Codegasm. All right, guys, let's get started. This is Codegasm episode three. If you haven't seen episodes one and two, I urge you to go watch them because we're kind of progressively building on stuff that we learned from the previous episode. So if this completely doesn't make sense to you and it feels like I'm going too fast, watch the first two episodes. I'm gonna try not to chase too many squirrels this episode. All right, first things first, let's get rid of Big Jerry and bring in Little Jerry. All right, so let's go ahead and start out by opening up Visual Studio. You guys remember that guy? Yeah, if you don't, watch episode one. That's where I teach you how to install it. All right, just like before, we're gonna go ahead and create a new project. So go up to File, see up here? I got my little thing, all right, new project. Make sure that it's a Visual C Sharp project, a Windows project, and a console application. If you do not see console application, you downloaded the wrong version of Visual Studio, go get the right one. You want the desktop version. All right, we need to give this application a name. Well, since it's gonna be pulling telemetry from the system and vocally talking to us using text-to-speech, let's go ahead and call it Jarvis, except for without the cool voice. All right, it's creating our project. Here we have it. Okay, just like before, you guys can see nothing's different from the previous lessons. We start out, we have a namespace, which is named after the project, Jarvis. We have a program class, and we have main, which is the entry point, where all the magic happens. All right, so now this episode, I'm gonna show you guys some really cool things that we can do. And one of those things is creating something called a performance counter. This is something that we haven't used before. Um, to do that, we need to add a new namespace. We're gonna add using system.diagnostics. Let's go ahead and make the text a little bigger for you guys because the diagnostics namespace contains a performance counter object. This is the new object that we're gonna learn about in this episode among some other things. Now, so you can get an idea of what a performance counter does. Let me just show you the program on the system that does it. So we're gonna minimize Visual Studio. You can see down here, I have performance monitor already sitting on my desktop. Uh, if you wanna open it yourself, just open the start menu and do a search for perfmon. That'll bring it up. Okay, let's open it up. So here's our performance monitor application. And if we click up here where it says performance monitor, you're gonna see we have this graph. Now this graph right now by default is showing us the percentage of CPU time used. Basically, you know, what percentage of your CPU is in use. And you can see if I come down here and open up my little CPU burn-in utility, let's just say I wanna run it for 10 seconds. As soon as I start this, you're gonna see the graph. See where it spikes up? You can see this little red spike over here. Yeah, that's 100% CPU usage. So it'll become clear why I have that program on here in a few minutes. The thing that you wanna pay attention to is down here. You have a counter name. See these columns down here? Counter name, you have the instance name and the object name. These are what we're interested in. And just to show you guys, you can actually add more counters. If you click on this little green plus up here or just right click and say add counters, you can see there's all these things, tons and tons and tons of things like TCP for instance. You can add counters for uh, you know, active connection counts, connection failures, you can add stuff for threads, you can add stuff for pretty much anything. The system has tons and tons of performance counters on it. Um, but for this demonstration, we're just gonna use a couple of them. All right, so now that I've shown you that, let's go ahead and minimize that. Open up Visual Studio. All right, so back in Visual Studio, we wanna create a performance counter that's capable of gathering that CPU information because we wanna know, you know, how much CPU is in use. So again, to do that, we need to create a performance counter. So we're just gonna call it perf, CPU count, that will just, that's just the name we're gonna reference it by, equals new performance counter. And then performance counter, if you look here, it takes a category name, a counter name, and potentially an instance name. So for this specific one, if we were to pull the data from the perf monitor, it would look like this. You have processor information, percent processor time, and underscore total. Those, those are the three variables that we're passing to get that information. So now we've created that object. We have our performance counter. Let's go ahead and leave a little comment. This will pull the current CPU load in percentage. 
All right, so now just to give you a demo of how this works, let's go ahead and just create a while loop. You guys will remember that from the previous episode. This is otherwise known as an infinite while loop. Now what we're gonna do inside of this loop, in an infinite loop, you generally wanna sleep. We have to add another namespace using system.threading. And then under there, we can do a thread.sleep for one second. Now, if you guys remember from the previous episode, this is gonna loop once a second. It's gonna go through here forever, forever and ever and ever and ever until we kill the process. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call console write line and I'm just gonna write out the current CPU load. So to do that, we'll just say CPU load, and then we're gonna put in our little token. Remember this little token right here means that we wanna replace a value. And we wanna replace it with perf CPU count, which is the instance of the counter that we created before, next value. Every time that function is called, it'll return the current state of that counter, like the current number. So if we just run this right now, hitting Control F5, you can see up the top CPU load is 0, 4%, 1%, 0%, 0%, 0%, 3%. So you kind of get an idea. And if we open the application on the desktop here, let me go ahead and shrink this down just a little bit. So you can see it. I'm going to open up the CPU burn-in tool, run it for five seconds. And you can see that the CPU utilization is now 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. Make sense? Okay, so now we have a mechanism to actually pull CPU data. You can see that's very, very lightweight piece of code. Very, very easy to manage. All right, remember, we always want to put a comment in here. Every one second, print the CPU load in percentage to the screen. And just to make it clear, let's go ahead and put a little percent symbol next to it. So that while it's, while it's playing, it'll actually show in percent. Actually, we'll put it afterwards. There we go. Okay, so in a very small amount of code, I just showed you guys how you can actually pull that. Now remember, you can do it for other stuff too. Like let's copy this line and let's grab another performance counter. So this time we're gonna use uh, the system memory, right? That's another thing that you'd wanna monitor. So we're gonna go ahead and grab the memory object and available megabytes. These Now, if you guys are wondering where to get these names, just remember, open up perfmon, add whatever counter you want to pull data from, and those columns down below will tell you what values to put into these places. Play around with it, you're not gonna hurt anything. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and call this the perf mem counter. You can see you have to give it a different name because you can't have two things having the same name. That would be ambiguous. So these are our instances. And let's go ahead and put a comment on this one. This will pull the current available memory in megabytes. Now. A lot of people might say that you don't need this level of commenting, and you really don't, but I find it really nice when you can come through here and read these because this is basically saying this is what the code below should be doing, and this is telling it what the code actually is doing. So these two, the comment and the code below it should always match. That's why I like doing this level of commenting. All right, so now that we have the memory count, let's go ahead and grab this line, copy it again down here. Do a lot of cut and pasting and code. It'll save you massive time. Uh, so let's go ahead and say available mem, Actually, we'll just spell it out, memory. And just so everything lines up, let's go ahead and move that over a little bit. And we'll just put megabytes at the end. Or actually better, we'll just do MB. And now we're gonna change this out with perf mem count. And if we run this application, control F5, it blows up. It says it couldn't find the category available megabytes. So I think I may have made an error somewhere up here. Can you see it? Yeah, I spelled it wrong. Also notice I forgot the S. Now, an exception, as you guys can see right there, when you run the program and it just crashes and it tells you there's an exception, usually you get a message that tells you what's going on. Like for instance, if I right click, you can see up here, we'll read it, it says, oh, I don't, there, there is no counter name called available M bytes. Now this is a really cool thing in managed code because in native code, you generally don't get this level of verbosity. In managed code like C Sharp, when something happens, it tries to do the best job that it can to tell you what happened to make it really easy to debug and fix the problem. So now let's go ahead and add the S. Now we have available M bytes, which should be the correct name. We run the program. You can see right now I have 1,321 megabytes and the CPU load is right around 0%. It's almost idle. I'm not using anything. Now, if I open a program, our available memory should go down. So let's go ahead and open up Chrome. Now you can see the memory actually dropped down a couple of hundred megabytes. So let's go ahead and close Chrome. And notice we didn't get a lot of that memory back. That's because Chrome, Chrome is kind of an ass. All right, so at this point, now we have a program that tells us what our CPU load is and our available memory, and it pulls every second and tells us that. 
Well, now what would be cool is if we could have this program running in the background and it could alert us to the status of the system without us having, having to have that giant console window up on the screen. So to do that, I'm gonna teach you guys something new. This is called adding a reference. So basically, if you need to add functionality that's available for you to program with in the form of these things called libraries and or DLLs, um, you add them this way. So you come over here at the corner where you have your solution explorer and then you click on reference, right click on reference, say add a reference. You want this right here. We're gonna add a reference and then you wanna come over here and do a search for speech. And you see there's a system.speech namespace. This is actually the Microsoft text to speech synthesizer library. Make sure you put a check mark next to it, hit okay. And now you can see it's added over here. It's now a part of the references of your project. You can add references to lots of stuff in there. You can even add references to stuff that's not .NET, things called com objects, and, and we'll explain all that stuff in future episodes, but again, baby steps. This is only episode three, guys. All right, so now we have to come up here and add another namespace. So we're gonna add system.speech synthesis. That's basically saying that we wanna use the speech synthesizer uh, object that's inside of that namespace. So now we're gonna come down here and we're just gonna, we're gonna initialize a speech synthesizer. We're gonna do it outside of the loop because again, things that we're gonna use repeatedly, we only wanna create once. We don't wanna keep recreating them over again. So we're gonna do speech synthesizer and we'll just call it synth equals new speech synthesizer, like so. Now the synth object itself, if you push period, you can see IntelliSense there are a lot of options. So just to keep it simple, we're just gonna use the function called speak. And speak, you can just pass it a string. Hello, how are you today? Now, when I run this program, this will greet the user in the default voice. Okay, so now when I run this program, watch what happens. Hello, how are you today? You can see it greeted us and then it started proceeding. Now, since we got some voice stuff going on now, I'm gonna go ahead and put on a pair of headphones so I can hear what you guys are hearing. Okay, so we're gonna just go ahead and put something in here like, welcome to Jarvis version 1.0, like that. Run it. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. So we've got our greeting. We're gonna go ahead and cut that out and move it all the way to the top because the very first thing we want our program to do is greet the user. All right, so just a quick recap. We have a way to get the current state of the CPU as far as percentage of CPU in use and the memory that the system currently has available. So let's go ahead and add one more performance counter just so we have nice diversity here. I'm gonna go ahead and just cut and paste this one in to make it easier. And we'll call this a uh, perf uptime count. And you see this is adding the system object and the system uptime value so this is going to give us the number of days hours minutes milliseconds the system's been online since it was last powered on and more specifically in seconds you always want to know what type of format the data is being returned to you because you may want to manipulate it into something else all right so we've got our counters i'm going to show you guys another thing that you haven't seen that helps you clean up your code it has absolutely no significance to how the code builds but if you do hashtag and type region my performance counters, like so. And then at the end down here, put end region, like that. And now you can see it gives you this little collapsible field. Now you can collapse that whole block of code down and it just makes things cleaner, especially when you're writing programs that have tens of thousands of lines of code and really long functions that are very, very heavy on code. This helps a lot. So we're gonna leave it expanded just cause I want you guys to see all the code. Okay, so let's go back to our while loop. So right now, we actually have a mechanism that every second, and I'm gonna go ahead and move the sleep. Notice I'm moving the sleep to the end because I don't want it to wait a second before it pulls the first values. I want it to pull the first values immediately and then sleep when I start the application. That's more efficient. Order of operations is important in programming. You can actually optimize a program hugely just by making a couple tiny little tweaks. So let's go ahead and add the speech ability to it. So for the speech ability, I'm gonna go ahead and create some strings. Uh, we'll just create this, we'll call this a CPU load vocal message, like that. And then I'm gonna use a string object with format, like this. This will allow me to create a string with inline values that I can later pass to something else. Let me give you an example. I wanted to say the current CPU load is, and then I'm gonna put my little, little moniker token in there that I wanna replace. And then I'm gonna say uh, perf CPU count next value. Now I've already introduced a bug here and I want you guys to see if you can find it. So I'm calling next value here. The problem with this is I'm also calling next value up here. So each time through this loop, I'm pulling two values. Well, I want the value displayed on the screen to be the same value that it's speaking to me. But what happens if between this point and this point, the value changes? 
then it's not gonna make a lot of sense. So to fix that, I'm gonna store the values in a variable and then reuse that variable. So up here at the top, I'm gonna do, uh, if you look at next value, it returns a float. See, uh, see down there in the little description, it says it, the return values of type float. So we know that, so we're gonna create a float and we're gonna call this CPU or current CPU percentage like that. And we're just gonna go ahead and set it to 0, .0. We're gonna create another float. And the difference between a float and an int is an int is a whole number and a float is a fractional number, actually with a decimal point. Okay, so now we got the current CPU. We also want the available memory. So current available memory equals 0.0. .0. And actually you're supposed to put an F on the end to indicate it's a float. Now you see this little green squiggly line here? That's basically saying that you're just, you're defining variables that are never touched or used. It doesn't mean there's a problem. You can still build and use it. So now what we're gonna do is see where we grab these values down here. We're gonna take those out and we're gonna assign them up here instead. So there's the current CPU. So we're gonna cut this out right here. We're gonna put that right there. So now these will initialize with the current value. And then we're gonna reuse these down here. You can see I'm just doing a little bit of cut and paste and moving stuff around. So now the order of operations is we enter the loop, we get the current CPU usage, we get the current available memory, we print it to the screen, and then we're gonna speak it to the user. Again, we want the sleep to be at the very, very end right before the closing brace right here. And I'll put a little comment on here. Uh, let's see, end of loop, just so you know that that's where the loop ends and keeps going around. All right, so now back to our speech. We have the CPU load vocal message and it's the current CPU load is 0%. And then we wanna replace that with the current CPU percentage right here. So now you can see because I'm using this, I'm getting the value here, I'm using it here and here, it's guaranteed to be the same there and the same there. It's not gonna change. If I keep calling next value, it could potentially change because time has elapsed between those operations. Okay, we're gonna do the same for the memory. Okay, we have the mem available vocal message and we'll say you currently have zero megabytes of memory available. Okay, now we want to go grab our current available memory variable and put it in there. All right, so let's see what we got here. We're going to say uh, speak to the user with text to speech to tell them what the current values are. All right, so now we've got our program here. You can see we've initialized some variables. So we'll, we'll put a comment here to get the current performance counter values. Okay. So now if we run this program, it's gonna print the values to the screen and then it's gonna speak it to us in a synthesized voice. You ready? Control F5. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. Hmm, something's wrong. It's not working. You know why? Because we created the strings, but we never used them. We never told the synthesizer to speak them. So what we need to do is type synth.speak CPU load vocal message. And then we're gonna do the same thing right below it for the memory message. Now we're gonna get a voice. Control F5. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. The current CPU load is 0%. You currently have 1,278 megabytes of memory available. Now it's pretty cool, huh? The current CPU load is 1.92699%. Now every you second we're gonna get 1, this. 1,278 megabytes of memory available. The current CPU load is 1.68028 Okay, we ran into a little bit of annoying problem there, but we're gonna solve problems as we go and refine the program because that's how Codegasm works. Now, the first problem is we don't want the CPU load with a bunch of decimal points. Starting to sound like data from Star Trek The Next Generation, right? Oh, how much time is it before lunch? Oh, it's 2.57 thousand billion nanoseconds. No, we don't need that. So what I'm gonna show you guys is how to turn the float into an integer. And the easiest way to round is you do something called casting. Basically, I'm just putting in these little parentheses here, int. And that's basically gonna say, I wanna convert the float to an integer or more accurately just snip off the end of the decimal point. There's other ways that you can do it. You can use the math object to do a true conversion, but for this, I'm just gonna keep it quick and dirty. So now if we run it. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. The current CPU load is 1.773589%. Oh, ran into a problem. Notice it says 1%. It says 1% on the screen, but that's because we converted it to an integer where we print it to the screen, but we didn't convert it to an integer where we have it actually speak the message out or more accurately where we create the message on these lines here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna fix this at the source because I don't, I don't wanna use the decimal point anywhere. I don't care. Throughout the entire program, I want it to be whole numbers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert these floats to ints. So now they're integers. 
And then I'm gonna say that I wanna cast the value coming out of that to an int, basically trim off all the excess. Now we'll get those solid numbers. And just in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, silence Jarvis. Remember, just two slashes, comment it out. Now we just jump right the to the numbers. CPU load is 0%. 0%. You currently have 1,292 megabytes of memory available. The current CPU load is 2%. You Notice it said 2%, one... it didn't give us a decimal point. That's perfect, that's what we want. Now, I also think that, uh, let, let's say we don't wanna do megabytes, let's say we wanna do gigabytes. You can do some inline math. Like for instance, let's say we want this to be gigabytes instead right let's go ahead and change the message to gigabytes down here where, where it actually talks now we're still going to print it on the screen in megabytes but we're going to have it say it in gigabytes and the way that we're going to do that is to convert the megabytes to gigabytes we're just going to divide it by a thousand and twenty four that's all you do we're going to now convert those megabytes to gigabytes current cpu load is zero percent you currently have one gigabytes of memory available. One gigabytes of memory available. Pretty cool, huh? How you can just like tweak these things. Okay, so now we got the thing talking to us. Let's go ahead and switch that back to uh, megabytes. Because realistically, if you got a gigabyte of memory for you, you're doing pretty good. We want, we want it to be megabytes. So now this thing, as we have it right now, just loops. It just loops and every second it tells us uh, the current state of the CPU and the current state of the memory, which is cool. So like for instance, if we run this right now. The current CPU load is 0%. You currently have 1,291 megabytes of memory available. Now I'm going to run the CPU burn-in. The current CPU load is 9%. Now this you is going to boost the CPU load. 1,273 megabytes of memory available. The current CPU load is 90%. 90% now. You currently have 1,282 megabytes of memory available. Let's see if it's 100%. The current CPU load is 100%. You currently have 1,281 megabytes. So as you can see right there, when I started up the CPU burn-in, it actually cranked the CPU up. All right, so this program is pretty damn annoying at this point. It's cool, but it's annoying. Now, to make it less annoying and useful, we only want vocal notifications when things hit certain thresholds, and we want it to say certain things when certain things happen. So for that, we need to add some logic to our program. And this is where if statements come in. So like for instance, let's always have it printed to the screen. No matter what, it's gonna print these values to the screen. But we only want it to vocalize when certain thresholds are hit. So like for instance, I can say if the current CPU percentage exceeds 80%, because remember everything's in percent, only then do I want it to create that vocal message and speak that message about the CPU. Same thing for the memory, if Current available memory, now remember this is gonna be in megabytes, is less than 1,024, so under one gigabyte of memory. Then I want it to tell us about the current state of the memory. So only tell us when memory is below one gigabyte. Up here, only tell us when the CPU is above 80% usage. All right, so now we've added some logic to that. So now if we run the program, what's gonna happen? You can see every second it's printing out the new stats, but we're not hearing anything because we haven't hit any of those thresholds. We have over a gigabyte of memory. So let's see if we can fix that. What I'm gonna do to just simulate uh, a bad memory condition is I'm gonna open up another little console window here. Show you guys, use Windows left and Windows right to put the windows side by side. So I'm just gonna start a whole bunch of Chrome processes. So I'm gonna say start chrome.exe, okay, right? Start one, start two, start three, start four, start five, start the six. The current CPU oh. load is 85%. We exceeded the CPU load. You Can, currently there have we go. 891 megabytes of memory available. See, now it's talking to us again. Every every second you after it's done talking, it's gonna come back. 79 megabytes of memory available. You currently have 862 megabytes of memory available. Notice it's telling us about the memory, but it's not telling you us about the CPU because the CPU isn't maxed out. Megabytes of memory available. All right, so let's kill all those Chromes. I'm gonna do you task kill I am Chrome exe-f. That's forcibly available. terminate them all. They're gone. Hopefully that'll bring our memory back up. And there we go. We're outside of the threshold again. Isn't that cool, guys? So now because we're outside of the threshold, it's not talking to us anymore. So now we've effectively made this program a warning system. You can just run this in the background minimized. And when your system gets too overburdened, it'll just start telling you about it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little more logic. So right now I say, if it's over 80%, just say, hey, the current CPU load is at 0%. But what if it gets to 100? We wanted to do something special at 100. So for that, I'm gonna do something called a nested if. I'm gonna put another if inside of here. 
So I'm going to say if current CPU percentage equals equals 100. So completely maxed out. I want it to do something special else do the normal thing. So the way that this runs, if you look at it, is it says, hey, is the current CPU percentage over 80? If so, run this block of code. In this block of code, it says if the CPU percentage is 100, run what's there. Otherwise, if it's not, run what's down there. You kind of get it? You can nest these if loops inside of each other to achieve any kind of logic that you want. So now if it hits 100%, I'm just going to copy this block of code where we create the message. Now notice I can create this twice. That's okay because notice it's, it's created inside of its own set of brackets. So it's not ambiguous because this dies when it leaves this and this dies when it leaves that. I hope it makes sense to you guys. But remember, as long as you leave this bracket, everything that was created between these two brackets gets destroyed. So now when it hits a hundred percent, we want to do something a lot cooler than just say, hey, the percentage. We're going to say, warning, holy crap, your CPU, CPU is about to catch fire. Okay, and we don't even need the CPU percentage because we know it's 100, we're not even gonna say it. So now what's gonna happen when I run this program is when the CPU usage gets above 80, it's gonna say the current CPU load is only you know 80%, 81%, but if it hits 100, it's gonna be like, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Okay, let's run it, Control F5. Okay, here we go, our little program is running. We're gonna go to the desktop. Let's go ahead and open our CPU burn-in application right here. Uh, let's just run it for five, for 10 seconds. Go. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. <laughs> Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to See how the speech is breaking up? The speech is actually breaking up because I'm using so much CPU, the program can't even handle it. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Okay, I'm going to quit. Now, now the CPU burn-in isn't running any longer, and we've dropped down to 0% usage. Pretty cool, huh? All right, let's close that down. Open up Visual Studio. Now, let's say that we want uh, the voices to be different. There's a couple voices in Windows 8 that come standard. There's a female voice and a male voice. So let's use a female voice for when the CPU is about ready to catch fire. So to do that, we're going to take our synthesizer object that we created, and we're going to select a voice. Now, you can do select a voice specifically to give it the name of the voice that you want, and you, there's the three voices that are available you can find on msdn.com. Or you can select by hint, which is how I prefer, because different people might have different voices on their system. So we're just going to select voice gender, female, and that's it. So now we're going to select the voice. Now the thing you have to remember is once you select the voice, it's going to be female all the time. So now we have to go to all the places where we're going to be speaking and change it to whatever voice we want that message to use. Otherwise, as soon as it runs this for the first time, then it's going to be female voice again until it changes. So we also speak right here. So let's go ahead and change that to a male voice. All right, we run it. Here she goes. We're gonna go ahead and uh, hit that burn in. Feel the burn. Okay, 10 seconds, burn in the CPU. Hit 100%. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Now we get a female voice, right? Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. And now we're back under 100%. We're under 80%, so it's not saying anything now. All right, you can see how we're kind of building on this now. I showed you guys how to create a reference so that you could actually bring in the speech synthesizer. So now we can have the computer say whatever we want, whenever we want. We added some logic to, to basically determine when it's going to say stuff. And we based it on the CPU load and available memory. Okay, now to finish our program up, let's go up to the top and let's actually take and uncomment out the part where it says, Welcome to Jarvis version you know, 1.0. We can actually do O because it'll it'll be able to read it better if it's actually words. So 1.0. And then the very first th the thing we're going to do is we're going to print out the system uptime. So we need to go down below where we created all of our counters. And before we enter the, enter the while loop, we're going to go ahead and just do a uh, new string. We'll say uh, vocal, uh, let's see, system uptime message equals string.format. Remember, just like I showed you before, we're going to create a string. Say the current system uptime is zero days like that. And then one hours, two minutes, three seconds. Now notice I did zero, one, two, and three. This is something new that I haven't showed you guys. This is the order of replacement. Now I can put four items in the end separated by commas and they'll replace. So for the next value we're gonna do, we're gonna get perf uptime right here. 
if you look at the uptime count, it returns a number in seconds. So I'm going to create something called a time span object. And we're going to call it uptime span. Sorry, equals time span because we're using a static method from seconds. And then we're going to pass it the perf uptime count next value. What this is going to do is call for the next value, which is going to return the number of seconds that the system's been up. Then, th then it's going to convert it into a time span object, which then takes those seconds and makes it accessible as days, hours, weeks, all that stuff. It's a lot easier than me just saying, hey, the system up time is 200,000 seconds. Now, another thing I'm going to show you guys is for cleanliness, you can actually go down to the next line. See this little guy right here? Wherever he ends is where the function ends. So you don't have to put everything on one line. So my four replacement values I'm going to put down here are up time span total days, like that, uptime span, total hours, uptime span, total minutes, and uptime span, total seconds. Then let's go ahead and close this out. Just put a little semicolon at the end, that means we're done. Now this is gonna create the message, and it's basically gonna replace zero with total days, one with total hours, two, with total minutes, and three with total seconds. So now we've got our message. Now we just want it to say it. That's all we want. So we're gonna take the synthesizer, just like so, and we're just gonna hit speak. We're gonna pass it that value like so, and say print, uh, tell the user what the current system uptime is. All right, if we run this, now it's gonna introduce the program. It's gonna tell us how long the system's been online, and then it's gonna start pulling data and letting us know when we start running out of CPU and running out of memory. Control F5 Welcome to run. to Jarvis version 1.0. The current system uptime is zero days, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. We have a problem. Now the interesting thing here is we actually call next value to basically get the uptime of the system and it's returning us zero everything. That is very, very strange. The reason being is everything is in total. We only want total days. The rest we want just to be hours, minutes, and seconds because those are how they pertain to that day. Total means I want all the hours that the system's been online. Well, since I've rebooted this you know, recently, that's not gonna be there. So we want total days, hours, minutes, seconds. Okay, so the problem is you have to call next value once to basically initialize the objects. So we're gonna go up here and do that for everything. We're gonna do perf mem count, uh, next value. We're not even gonna store the value because we don't care. The first value is gonna be nothing. So those are gonna initialize it. And then the other thing that we have to do is remember, these are all gonna be doubles, which are just like floats. They're like huge floats. So there's still gonna be a decimal point. And I don't want it to say the system uptime has been 0 0.1357895 days. I want it just to give me the number. So I'm gonna go ahead and just cast those just like I showed you before. This is just gonna trim off all the decimal points like so, and now it should work. Control F5. Oh, it says we have an error. Where's our error at? Oh, right here. Took us right to it. Just recognize we didn't have Welcome the little to braces Jarvis on it. version 1.0. Okay. The current system uptime is zero days, one hours, 46 minutes, 12 seconds. One hour, 46 minutes, 12 seconds. Perfect. All right, so, so far so good. You guys can see the foundation that we have laid down here is really strong. Now we haven't created any functions and some of the other episodes we created functions, but there really isn't anything that we've had to break out. But now there is. So let's go ahead and optimize the program a little bit. We're gonna come down here, we're gonna create new a new function. We're gonna do a public static void because it doesn't return anything. And speak, we're gonna create our own speak method and it's gonna take a string, which is the message we want it to stay and the voice gender that we want it to use. Those are our two input parameters because we use this everywhere. So we're just gonna copy this down here. And now when we select the voice, we're gonna pass in this. See where it says voice gender right here? That's the value passed in. We're gonna pass that to the voice selector. And then for the string that we're creating, we're just gonna go ahead and use, well actually we don't even need this. We can just use that string and we're just gonna have it speak the message. So now we've consolidated these two calls into there. But notice we have a problem. Why is there a red line under synth? The reason is, is we created synth inside of the main function. We didn't create it globally where everything could see it. So let's go ahead and fix that. Let's go find where we initialize our synthesizer right here. That's where we initialize our synthesizer. We're gonna move that out into the class like this. Now by putting the synthesizer outside of here, now it's accessible to all the functions. Before you could only use it inside a main, now you can use it everywhere. 
Oh, and we need to make it static. Remember, everything has to be static because we're not creating an instance of program. Static means you don't have to create that instance. So at this point, our build succeeded. We now have a function down here. We're just gonna say, uh, speaks with a selected voice. And now we're gonna go back through where we have, where we make all these different calls. We're just gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna replace this with our version of the speak API and pass it the voice that we want it to speak in. So let's just do a uh, mail for that one. Same up here, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that. We're gonna use our speak method, not the one under synth, and pass it a voice, female. Same thing up here, come up here, get rid of that. We no longer have to select the voice now each time because we can just pass it in line to our version of the speak function, right here. Voice gender male, all right. So now we have simplified our program a little bit. So now we have this function down here that can speak, and that's great. So that that actually you know significantly reduced our code because we didn't have to keep selecting the voice over and over again. We're doing that inside of this function. So now let's say that we want to change the speed at which it talks. Because let's be honest, it talks kind of slow. So to change the speed at which it talks, you would normally just take the synth the synth object that we created earlier and do rate equals two or three or four or five six. Basically, how many times faster or slower you want it to speak. But because we already have a function, we're gonna create yet another function. I'm gonna show you guys how to do something called an overload. Now this is this is probably a little bit confusing, but you guys, you guys will pick it up, I know you will. So I'm basically gonna just recreate the same function twice. So now I have this one here and this one here. Notice they have the same exact signature. If I try to build this, what's gonna happen? Oh my God, you already defined something called speak with that parameter type, you can't do it. Well, as long as the signature is different, it can have the same name. So we're gonna put an int of speed. Or actually, let's call it rate, just so it makes sense. So the rate at which it talks. Now, if I build this, we're good. Why are we good? Because now it's a new function. Speaks with a selected voice at a selected speed. And all we're gonna do is call the original one, speak with message, voice gender, so notice I'm passing this directly through and this directly through. So what happens is now when you call this version of the function right here, it's going to pass this value and this value to this function. And then this function is going to use it internally to change the voice and then speak the words. But we're going to add to it. We're going to say we want to change the rate. So we're going to take that global synthesizer rate and make it equal to five. We're going to make it talk really fast or better yet. Sorry, rate. We don't want to use, we don't want to use a static value. We want to pass rate to it. So now that I've done that, if I come up here, notice it still compiles, it still runs, everything works, but now I have the option to make it speak really fast by just changing one thing. Notice now I have two different versions of that function listed, one that takes a rate and one that does not. So I'm going to change the rate to five here, change the rate to 10 here. That'll be super, super fast. And then when we hit the warning, I'm going to have it speak uh, just regular. Actually, no, I'll have, it, I'll have it speak like three. So they're all different speeds now. And now up here, see where we just had the, the synth speaking the message? We can fix that and just use ours too. Notice I'm just taking synth off because now we're using our speak API. And so it's less confusing because I know you guys are, uh, some of you guys might be confused by the whole synth speak versus just calling speak. I'm going to rename the API to something just so it, it's not ambiguous. Uh, and to do that, if you want to rename something later on and have it rename it throughout the whole program, just right click on it, go to refactor, rename, and we're gonna call it J Jerry speak. Just so we can see, now it's unique. Everything should still build. And now we're gonna pass it the right arguments. There's the message we wanna send. The gender of the voice we wanna send is male and the speed that we wanna send it at, we'll say is two. And we have a problem. It says no method for Jerry speak takes three arguments. The problem is it renamed one, but it did not rename the other. So we just have to carry that down like that. And now these all have to be changed to Jerry speak. So I'm just gonna go replace all those. So some because I used an overloaded function, I had two that, that were the same name. When I renamed one, it didn't rename the other, and that's where it confused things. All right, so let's run it. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. The current system uptime is zero days, one hours, 53 minutes, 15 seconds. Okay, now we're gonna see how fast it speaks when we uh, overload the system. CPU burning, let's go. One, 10 seconds, start. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Oh, it's chopping Holy a little bit. Holy crap, your CPU is about to go. catch fire. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Okay, so it's giving us the warning. That's cool. So now you can see we broke that out into two functions that make that just a lot cleaner. Now, 
I'm gonna do something cool using a variable. What we wanna do is each time that it issues a warning, we want it to talk faster. So if we come down here to where we issue the warning, right now we're just passing it three. If you guys look right here, we're just passing it a static value. Let's create an integer. It has to be outside of the while loop, because remember, if, if you do it inside the while loop, each time through the while loop, it's gonna recreate it. So outside the while loop, I'm gonna say int be speech speed equals one, like that. So now that I've got that variable initialized, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna put it right there. And all I'm gonna do is type plus plus at the end. That means increment it by one. If I wanted to increment it faster, I could say plus equals two or three or five or six or so on. So we're gonna say plus plus plus. That's gonna take speech speed and add one to it each time. So the first time it runs, it's gonna be at speed one, then speed two, then speed three, then speed four, then speed five. So you're gonna see him gradually getting faster and faster as he gives us the warning. Welcome to Jarvis version 1.0. The current system uptime is zero days, one hours, 55 minutes, six seconds. Okay, here we go. We're gonna run it for 30 seconds. Start. Now listen. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. That's speed one. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Speed two. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Speed three. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Speed four. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Speed five, we're getting faster. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. See, it's getting faster. Warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. <laughs> that's pretty cool, huh? And now it's super, super fast. So now that's cool because it kind of shows you how programming can be really dynamic. Because I replace this with a variable that I can increment, I can actually change the speed of the speech each time the message is said. That is cool. Because you might want to be in a scenario where uh, you want it to keep getting your attention. You want you want it to convey severity. You could also do that by maybe picking a different voice, changing the volume, things like that. You can do all that stuff. But the problem with this, of course, is left unchecked, the speed's going to get up to 100, and it's just going to be like, blah, 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 and it's and it's not going to work. So you want to cap it out at something. So what you can do is say inside of here, we're going to create another if. This is another if statement. We're going to say if speech speed is greater than five, or sorry, less than five, then we wanna increment it. So we're gonna copy that right there. Like a so, put it right there like a so. And we're gonna increment it and then we're just gonna use speech speed. Now, what do you guys suppose this is gonna do? Let me walk you through it. So if the CPU percentage is at 100, it's gonna check to see if the speech speed is under five. If it's under five, it's gonna increment it. But if it hits five or goes over five, it's not gonna increment it anymore, which means the max speed that the voice will ever reach is five. And the reason being is it's gonna enter if it's four and then it's gonna increment it one last time. Now notice, we just keep building on things. You guys, I want you to keep going. Like when you take this program, which I'll include, I'll put it on GitHub, the whole project will be available in the solution and that, that beep was something I forgot to mute on my computer. Don't worry, it wasn't your message. I want you guys to take this project and I want you to keep building on it and trying new things because I absolutely love seeing what you guys did. With the Magic 8-Ball app that we did last time, you guys did some really cool stuff that I really, really like. So I'm curious to see what you can do with this because now I've given you legitimate access to system resources is to pull data and act on it. And I've also given your program a voice, the ability to speak. That is something huge. It's one thing to be able to print text in a console. It's another thing entirely to be able to get the computer to speak to you. So I have a cool idea. How about instead of having it just say the same message every single time, we give it a couple of different options. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. So let's go back up to the top of our program here. And we're gonna go ahead and create a list of responses. Now I'm not gonna do it for everything in the program. I'm just gonna do it for when it's reporting that the CPU is about to explode. So I'm gonna create something called a list object. And the neat thing about a list object is it's a strongly typed generic. What that means is I can make it a list of anything, but I have to say what it's a list of. So inside of these little brackets, the greater than less than, we're gonna say the type, so just a string. I'm gonna create a list of string objects and I'm gonna call it, uh, let's see, CPU maxed out messages equals new. And if you just hit space, it, it auto completes it. It's actually really, really cool. So now I've created some storage for some messages. So let's create some messages. Our first message that we had down here, of course, was warning, holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. That's a good one. Let's say we want to keep that, all right? Let's take this back up to the top and we're going to add it. So CPU maxed out messages dot add, and then we're going to put the message in there. We don't want double quotes though. So that's one of the messages. Now we want to, let's, let's add five more. So warning. So holy crap, your CPU is about to fi catch fire. How about, oh my God, you should not, or not OMG, you have to spell it out, remember. Oh my God, you should not 
run your CPU that hard. Or uh, message number three, warning, stop downloading the porn. It's maxing me out. Uh, let's see. Number four, your CPU is officially chasing squirrels. And for the final one, we're just going to put red alert, red alert, red alert, red alert. I farted. Just like that. That's all we're going to do. So now we've got five messages in that list. The problem is now, how do we get it to randomly select them? Now, if you guys watched Codegasm episode two, you'd know we can create a random object. We'll just create a random object called Rand. And all we're going to do with this random object in here, let's, let's put comments. Remember, comments are important. List of messages that will be selected at random when the CPU is hammered. Okay. And then down here, we're just going to call this the dice, like D&D. Dungeons and Dragons. All right, so anyway, so we got a random counter. We're going to come down here. Now, where was that message? Right here. Holy crap, your CPU's on fire. We're going to replace that. And we're going to replace it with our CPU maxed out messages. This is our collection. We don't need string format anymore. But now, inside of brackets, we have to give it the index. The square brackets, we give it the index of the message we want. We know that there's four message, there's five messages in there, but zero through four. So we want a random number between zero and four. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our random object next and say we want a number between zero and four. Just like that. That's it. That's all we had to do. Now, every time through the loop, it's going to get a new random number between zero and four, and it's going to select that message. Watch what happens. Welcome Control to Jarvis five. version 1.0. The current system uptime is 0 days, 2 hours, 1 minutes, 48 seconds. Okay, you guys are going to love this. Ready? Actually, let's do it for 30 seconds so that it has enough time to say all the different messages. Warning. Holy crap. Your CPU is about to catch fire. That's one. Warning. Holy crap. Your CPU is about to catch fire. Okay, pick the same one twice. That's not Warning. uncommon. Oh my god, you should not run your CPU that hard. <laughs> okay. Warning. Holy crap. Your CPU is about to catch fire. Ooh, it's really catching Warning. that one. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. Warning, stop downloading the porn, it's maxing me up. <laughs> Warning, your CPU is officially chasing squirrels. Warning, stop downloading the porn, it's maxing me up. Now you can notice there was a lot of repeats, but that's because when you're rolling a dice that only produces four numbers, you're not going to have a high likelihood of hitting everything. And if I remember right, we actually need to make that a five, guys, because we want to return a number between zero and four, and it's zero based. So that should get the last one. And you guys are going to find bugs in this program, because realizing this isn't planned out. I'm actually creating this program uh, along with you, because I like that Codegasm is me sitting here developing something completely from scratch. I don't want to just open up a project and walk you guys through through it and be like, this does this, this does this. I'm doing all this in real time because I want you guys to see the process and how I think. So also notice the speed never exceeded five. Notice that it got really fast, but it didn't get overly fast. That's perfect. That shows us that this piece of code was working right here. And we'll put a comment on this and just say, this is designed to prevent the speech speed from exceeding five times normal, right? Just a comment. Okay, so now you guys can see this program basically tells you when the CPU exceeds a certain threshold, it changes the voices. You guys can tweak this stuff infinitely. Trust me, take this program, do some really cool stuff with it. But the last thing that I'm gonna show you guys before we go is that we're using the performance counters to find things to say. But there's other things you can do too. You don't have to say something. You could start a program, for instance, right? So the very last thing I'm gonna show is how to start a process from this process. It's actually quite easy to do. If you want to start a process, I'll just show you inside of the while loop here. You just create a process object. We'll just call it P, P1 for first process, equals new process, and then P1 start info dot file name. Give it the file name. We're going to call it chrome.exe, and we're going to do P1 start. Now, every second when I run this, it's going to start a new Chrome. Welcome to Jarvis version 1. Wait for it. The current system uptime is 0 days, 2 hours, 5 minutes, 20 seconds. Okay, notice Chrome open. CPU Chrome is 97%. Now watch, Chrome's gonna open again next time through the loop. Another Chrome, another Chrome, another Chrome. Okay, you can see that that could get pretty annoying quick. So we're gonna go ahead and close that down. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this little block of code that we just created to start a process, and we're gonna create a function from it because we want it to do a very specific thing. We're gonna call it open website string URL. And what it's going to do is it's going to start Chrome, but we want it to have arguments. So you do the arguments equals HTTP 
and whatever website you want to go to. So we'll just do URL. We want to pass the URL in. Just like that. So now what's going to happen is when you call this function, it's going to take this URL that you passed into the function, put it in as the argument after Chrome. Now, if you don't have Chrome installed, this isn't going to work. You could change it to iExplorer for Internet Explorer or Firefox EXE for Firefox. Whatever you want to do. So now that I have this function, all it's going to do is, you know, open a website. And also explore the process object. You can do a lot with it. You can do like start info. If you look under here, you can tell it to create no window. If you want it to be hidden, you can actually have it do some pretty cool stuff, redirecting output, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we want window style to equal, uh, let's do maximized. So I want I want every window to open up and fill the whole screen because I because I, that's the whole thing. So what I'm going to do is when your CPU reaches 100% uh, load, I want it to Rick roll you. All right, so what we're going to do is every single time your CPU hits 100%, it's basically going to open Chrome and Rickroll you. So let's go back up to our code where we check to see if we're at 100% CPU usage right there. And again, you can use those regions if you want. Like if you want to say this, just say uh, logic. Let's create a region for all the logic in here. And region, sorry. And now you can collapse that and it just looks cleaner. So I urge you guys to use region in your programming and comments. Use comments heavily. All right, so now that we're at 100% CPU, we're going to have it speak still, but we're going to do one more thing. We're going to call open website. That's our thing. And then we're going to give it a URL. And now what's going to happen is every single time the CPU exceeds 100%, it's going to open a Chrome window and Rick roll you. Now, remember, every second, it's going to open a new window and a new window and a new window. So we're going to get like thoroughly Rick rolled on this. If you only want it to open one window, then you create something called a switch. And to show you how to create the switch, I'll show you really quick. Just create a bool. A bool value is true or false. That's all it does. So bool is already open or is chrome opened already equals false and then all we're going to do is come down here and put another if statement that says if is chrome already open equals tr uh, equals equals false then open the website otherwise don't and then the, after we open the website the very next thing we do is set this to true that's called a switch. Basically, I call it a switch. I'm sure there's there's other people that call it other things. But basically, I've created the switch. So now the first time it comes through and that's false, it's going to open the web page and then set it to true so that next time it comes through here, it'll be true and it'll jump over that whole block and it won't open the website again. So let's go ahead and run that. All right, here we go. We're starting CPU burning. Do, do 10 minutes. Here we go. Watch. We're going to get Rick rolled as soon as the CPU hits 100%. Warning. Holy crap, your CPU is about to catch fire. And currently have 1,004 megabytes of memory available. Uh oh, our switch isn't working. Notice it's opening a new tab each time. We better fix that bug. All right, can you guys find the bug? I'll give you a hint. That's not supposed to be right there. What's happening is every time it loops through this while loop, it's recreating that to false, which means even though I set it to true right there, it doesn't remember it. So what we need to do is simply grab this and move it outside of the while loop. That's it. Once we do that, we're good to go. And then I'm going to move the speech after it opens Chrome, because I want Chrome to open immediately. I don't want it to have to finish talking first. Let's try this one last time. Okay, notice we're good. Nothing's talking yet. And go. CPU is now burning in, hitting 100%. Warning, stop downloading the porn. It's maxing me out. There we go. We're getting Rick rolled. Warning, stop downloading the porn. It's maxing me out. Warning, your CPU is officially chasing squirrels. Boom. Stop downloading the porn, it's maxing me out. Okay, we got our memory back and we got our CPU back. So notice, it's not talking anymore. It's just monitoring. All right, guys, well, I think that is plenty for Codegasm Episode 3. I think I've armed you guys with some crazy, crazy new stuff. I would say that at this point in the series, after Episode 3, you guys should have enough to clearly go create something awesome. And just to let you guys know, I plan to actually keep evolving this application on my own because I want to use something like this uh, for an early alert system, especially when I'm playing games. I'm actually going to adapt it to detect an incoming DDoS attack. Now, you guys, it would be too hard to show you that code. We've got a couple lessons to go first, but I just want you guys to understand that you can take something like this and modify it and get it to do exactly what you want it to do. And I'm just curious to see what kind of crazy stuff you guys come up with. Whew. Well, guys, that was a long episode. I apologize for that, but I hope you guys enjoyed it all the same. We packed a lot of stuff into this episode, and the end result was something really cool. So cool, in fact, I'm going to continue developing it on my own. If you guys are interested in the project files and the source code, they're stored on GitHub. Just look at the video description for details. Also, always look at the video description on my videos because I put lots of information down there. I put corrections. I put links. I even have all my affiliate links down there to get you guys discounts and to help my channel out, as well as all of my contact information. I'm a 
pretty social guy. Now, if you guys made it all the way to the end of this very lengthy episode, please comment down below with hashtag code porn. It helps me know how many of you guys are really engaged and how much you're enjoying this and lets me know if I can continue to make videos that are this length. Also, if you guys have any suggestions, leave those down in the comments also, or better yet, come tweet me at Barnacles over on that Twitter thing. I'm gonna wrap this up because I think it's officially the longest video I've ever created on YouTube. And I'm not gonna lie, it takes me an entire day to create one of these episodes. But it's totally worth it because of the feedback you guys have given me. So keep it coming, it's a huge motivator, and I thank you again. All right guys, until next time. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel, it helps me a lot. Also come over to Twitter, I'm at Barnacles. I'm a real social guy. Also, if you have a couple of minutes, check out some of these many other videos. I made them myself.